Good afternoon and welcome to Increasing Provider Efficiency and Improving Patient Care with Electronic Prescribing of Controlled Substances, a webinar tweet chat combo from HealthSystemCIO.com sponsored by Improvada. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com and I will be your moderator today. Uh, Kate Gamble, our managing editor and, di and director of social media, will be hosting a tweet chat alongside our event. You can participate in a separate browser or on your phone by using the hashtag HSCIOChat, or you can just view the, the tweet chat in the media viewer panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Other WebEx panels that we'll use today are the Q&A panel, which you'll use to send in questions. You can send them in as they occur to you and leave the default set to all panelists, and we'll pose them later in the program. And you can see on your screen the URL for the deck. It's also at the bottom of the slides, and we'll send it out in the chat box. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to go 30 to 35 minutes. We're going to hear from Todd Smith, Dr. Todd Smith, CMIO at Health East Care System. Then we're going to hear from Dan Borgasano. Uh, he's Senior Product Marketing Manager with Improvada, our sponsor. And then we're going to have our Q&A with Todd Smith, who's going to be joined by Joanne Sunquist, SVP and CIO at Health East Care System. So without further delay, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Todd Smith. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Smith. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone out there from the frozen Midwest. Um, I'm excited to be here talking about this uh, item today that we've done here at Health East, and we think we've done a pretty good job of it. So we're happy to talk about prescribing electronically the controlled substances and how we did it here at Health East. We're going to start with our um, obligatory agenda slide here. We're going to talk a little bit about why this all matters. And when we talk about EPCS, that's what we're talking about, electronic prescribing of controlled substances. We're going to talk a little bit about the DEA and how that interrelates with EPCS and how we have to do things a certain way. And then how we did things here at Health East when we rolled it out. And we're going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end as well. A little bit about Health East Care System. For those of you who do not know about us, we're a network of integrated care services in the Twin Cities, uh, mostly in the St. Paul, what we call the East Metro area and the surrounding suburbs. We have three short-term acute care hospitals and one long-term acute care hospital. Uh, we have 14 primary care clinics. We also have quite a few subspecialty uh, clinics embedded there and in other places as well. We're at around 7,500 employees. And, you know, at Health East, a little bit about us. You know, our vision is we're, that we are dedicated to optimal health and well-being for our patients, our community, and ourselves. We like to empower our patients best we can by giving them user-friendly access to health information, really giving them great dependable quality service and high-quality care. Uh, we really try to be innovative here at Health East, putting efficient models of care into practice, really allowing our employees and our physicians and our providers to focus on what is important, and that, of course, is taking care of patients. And in the end, all of this that we're going to talk about here today really is about helping to take care of patients better and at the same time making the providers' lives a little easier alongside that. We went live with Tap and Go and our EPCS as part of that 2014 EHR Go Live. And we're going to talk about why that is so important uh, a little bit later on in the talk. And also, of course, to note we were the first health system in Minnesota to go live with EPCS. A little bit about why this matters. Um, it's in the news nearly every day now about how much of a problem the prescription drug issue is in our society. As you can see from the slide in front of you, uh, a trend, a, an alarming trend upward, really, of more deaths from prescription drugs uh, that we physicians give out than cocaine and heroin combined. Uh, it's in the headlines, like I said, almost every day nationally and even within our own communities. Uh, case in point here, uh, the headlines came across last earlier this year about Prince and how we lost him way too early to prescription drugs. 
and the abuse of prescription medications national public health crisis contributing to more as you can see than 25,000 deaths annually. Um, we see this in the emergency departments with visits involving misuse or ab abuse of prescription opioids that increased more than 150 percent if you look at between 2004 and 2011. We have admissions to substance abuse to these going up, uh, quadrupling between 02 and 12, uh, and then as mentioned here, the deaths uh, going up at an alarming rate. So you look at this and why EPCS matters, this really matters as far as this is one solution, just one part of a bigger solution to try to help tackle this. We can try to uh, avoid some doctor shopping in here for pills and reduce the, reducing the drug diversion and fraud that we have present. Another slide about why this matters, we can improve provider workflows and we can improve patient safety. They accomplish both of those, really everybody wins. Uh, right now, what we have in a lot of places is this inefficient dual workflow. So our patients don't get it why certain medications have to be treated differently than others. So if you have electronic prescribing at your organization, I, as a physician, can refill my patient's lisinopril or their high blood pressure medication electronically, and I can send that away. And at the same visit, I may have to in refill their Percocet or their MS Contin for their other issues, and there's a whole different workflow with that. I have to hand them a piece of paper for that. So that leads to frustration from the patients, since they can go to the drugstore and they can pick up their lisinopril right away, but then they have to hand them this written prescription, and then they have to wait another length of time before they can actually leave the pharmacy, or they have to come back, and it's very frustrating, and they don't like that. This is really one workflow that we can wrap up both of those in the same one. There's been some studies around this showing about 38 to 40 percent of the time patients get prescriptions from their physician. There's a mix of controlled and non-controlled substances, and so that leads to that inefficient process. What's more, you know, there's increased risk of DEA number theft and fraud and drug diversion any time that there is a non-electronic way to do this, and amazingly, you know, faxes are still being used for this, and if you think about the secure level of a fax machine, um, it's kind of just alarming that that's still being used. The number of written prescriptions that have to be either written or printed for controlled substances is also on the rise, um, even up to 30% of a projected for this year of these kind of prescriptions. And the, the, the big part of that is that hydrocodone, or more commonly referred to as Vicodin or Lortab, went from Schedule 3 to Schedule 2, and we're going to talk about the Controlled Substance Act, but basically that means that all of those have to be written now or printed and high wet signed by the provider. But this EPCS solution allows you to go around that and do it actually in an even more secure way, more convenient, and just a better way for everyone involved. It decreases that issue of diversion and fraud. A lot of Places I still see written prescriptions with their with the provider's DEA number printed out on the prescription, which obviously is a recipe for disaster. The other uh, issue to think about along with this, if you're considering this, is that we'll talk a little bit more about this also in more detail. But CMS is recommending that e-prescribing move to a core objective for hospitals in stage two, and that that might be difficult to meet the threshold for that without EPCS, considering how many of these prescriptions that we do are actually controlled substances. I talked about the hydrocodone reclassification as well. Uh, there also are some legislative things that are happening that are going to lead to this being a more prominent issue, perhaps, for you all. New York State has has had this law that they have put the I stop law, which mandates the use of electronic prescribing for all prescriptions, and that actually includes controlled substances. That's actually probably going to pave the way for EPCS to be mandated across the country. We might be a few years away from that, but you can see the writing on the wall that this is where it's coming down, that we're going more and more toward electronic prescribing, wrapping up controlled substances in that, and 
again, talks happening at the national level even to think about mandating EPCS across the country. So we talk about the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, and I'm not going to read through all five, 600 pages of that law from 1970, but basically what the DEA did back then was develop schedules for these controlled substances, one through five. And the most addictive, or what was perceived to be the most addictive uh, drugs put at the top of those schedules, and then working their way down one through five. Um, there has been some movement between those schedules, as I alluded to with the hydrocodone question, but generally, once they've gotten put into schedules, they tend to stay there. But why did they do this? Well, they were trying to control these substances, obviously, and trying to make sure that who's prescribing them is a, a proven DEA-registered physician and then provider as we started using more mid-level providers. They're, they're putting control into this EPCS, so they're the C in this. So they want to, number one, make sure the prescription was written by an authorized provider. And then number two, ensure that it was filled by an authorized pharmacist. So there's another whole back-end authorization on the pharmacy side. And then number three, making sure that obviously what I'm writing or delivering is delivered to the correct patient. So whether it's transmitted electronically, phoned in, written in, or as I mentioned, the uh, 1980s technology of faxing, uh, all three of these criteria have to be met on every transaction. So we as a provider organization then obviously are responsible for that first line. We have to make sure that the provider is doing this are authorized to do this. Uh, we then have leverage outside companies and pharmacies to manage those second and third ones, but we really have to be on the, on the line for that first one. So the next slide is going to show what the DEA requirements are for EPCS and actually could just be controlled substances generally. Um, but when we talk about the two-factor authentication, that's where EPCS comes in. So identity proofing, there has to be a method for that to ensure that I am Dr. Smith, who I am, and that I have the credentials that allow me to prescribe this. I have a DEA number. Uh, they know that it's me. It's tied to me and my organization. So we have to be able to ensure that and then have that built into our EHR, that that is the case. We talk about enrolling. Uh, we're going to come to that a little bit more later when we talk about how we got our, pro our providers to sign, to sign on. When the, there has to be a control or an enforcement on the right side there about once a prescription is signed, it can't be changed. So if I do this process and I need to change it, I have to actually do some calling, pulling back on the prescription, and, and changing it a different way. It just can't be changed. If it's transmitted successfully, any printed prescription orders must be marked as copies. So if I fill it electronically, they come back and say, well, something happened, something didn't work. I can't just print them out one and say, well, here you go. Here's a written one. We can't do that. We have to have ways of preventing that from happening. And then, again, if that transmission fails, you have to document what happens. So if, if then on my end, it didn't transmit through somehow, then I could print them out one to give them, but then I have to really be careful and document on an auditable way of how that was done. And all of this is subject certainly to an ongoing audit trail for all of these activities, from the identity proofing all the way through to the order signing. So all of that's kept track of very well by, most, by the EHR. Another slide on the DEA, this law actually became effective on June 1, 2010. We went live in 2014, and even though it was four years into this, we had some trouble with some of the pharmacies around because we were, as mentioned, we were the first ones in Minnesota, certainly in the Twin Cities, to go live with this method of doing it. So some of it was me calling a few pharmacies and saying, hey, guess what, you actually can do this, when we got pushback from them and say, well, we can't accept that. No, you actually can. And the, the bigger chain pharmacies were obviously quicker to come along with us. We had a couple of what I call mom and pop pharmacies, and we had a little bit more trouble with them as they had to you know, invest in some software and some ways of accepting these prescriptions. But once we got past that, everybody's happy. So 
Again, the primary goal, reduce the potential for that diversion and then subsequent abuse of these controlled substances. So it is certainly now legal and available in all 50 states. There have been two that have mandated it. It's New York and Maine. I'm guessing there are going to be more and more as we go through time here. As of the summertime, when we um, take a look at this last, however, there are only about 6% of providers nationally that are enabled for this. So, you know, the question is why? And a lot of it's probably around change and a lot of, you know, the, the, the perception that this is really hard to do. Uh, and part of what I'm going to try to get through today is it's not that hard and it's actually really great once you get it done. Uh, and again, if a mandate's coming, it's best to be on the front side of that. Even though all these DEA rules are pretty complex, it is something that using the right technology and honestly the way we did it, it really isn't all that hard. This is one of the more important slides to me. Um, the way we did it and why we feel we were so successful with it is that we really looked at this as not an IS project that's thrust upon the providers and people that are using it, but really a partnership between the technology, the end users, and then also getting other people that are that need to be involved with this rollout part of it. So looking back, it's kind of amazing to think that we, from inception to full implementation, this really only took six months. And that really goes to the team here as well as how we rolled out the technology, which we'll get to a little bit later, as well as the, the partnership amongst all the people involved. So we had to get the providers on board. We had to, to educate them, to inform them, to show them this was a good thing, that this was going to make their lives easier. As probably all of you know, if you can get providers to think that what you're doing makes their lives easier, you will instantly get them on your side. So we had to have a significant involvement between our desktop engineering team and our security team uh, and then just our IS team in general. The, one of the biggest parts of this is that we integrated this project with our EHR build and our go live and then our other legacy systems tied to single sign-on. So you're going to hear later about the single sign-on solution and how we rolled those things together that I can use my badge to tap in uh, and sign on to our screens and we roll that out at the same time we did this fingerprint deal for the EPCS. We also timed that to the installation and the go live of our new EHR. So it was all needing to be synergistic with each other and then we also had a requirement to do that with the provider onboarding process. We enlisted marketing. They helped us out a great deal, and we developed a, they developed an enterprise-wide campaign to engage those providers in the upfront authentication process, which we're going to get to. And we, in, we ingrained, if you will, that training for the EPCS and the single sign-on. We put that right together with the training of our EHR. We had fairs on site to get providers authorized. We had to get everybody's fingerprint. We had to get their badge authorized and trained to the new workflow. But that part, although that seems like it was a huge deal, and it kind of was, but to do it that way really set us off in the right foot and got us going really well. We um, had a lot of other information, too. We, we did workstations on carts in the hospital. We had one-on-one -on -one trainers working with these people. If they missed the training or they missed the enrollment of the fingerprints, uh, and, and it just went off really well. There's, of course, a technical impl implementation to this whole thing as well. We had to involve uh, our virtualization and desktop team, and we had to build the desktop images and test servers. We, we built high availability among the data centers and capacity to run enterprise at two sites. We had also leveraged creating different desktop images depending on where these folks were. So we wanted to be able to do, part of what I really wanted to have happen, and we did, was to have the ability for me as a provider sitting in the clinic with the patient, looking the patient in the eye, being able to do that prescribing right in the room with them, not having to get up and leave and go to my office and say, hang on, I'll be right back. I'm going to prescribe your Vicodin over here because I need a fingerprint reader. 
So we put all a whole lot of these keyboards with fingerprint readers embedded in them into all of our exam rooms in the clinic. And that really made a big, huge advantage to be able to do this. And the patients love seeing this. They love seeing me put my fingerprint on there, and they're amazed that that works. And it was really a neat thing to get the patient involved as well. But getting back to the other desktop images, we would have a different look for the private offices. And along with that, we worked with the security team to create different timeouts on, a, say, a private office where we're never going to have patients going by, so I don't have to I sign on constantly throughout the day. But if it's an exam room, obviously, lots of different people use that exam room all the time or think about a hospital kiosk station with a computer that everybody uses throughout the day, those obviously have very strict security um, uh, lockouts on them. The fade to black and the, and the, lock, and the workstation lock where you have to re-tap to get back in. So as you can see, we enrolled 7,700 users with this tap and go. About 1,000 providers were authenticated for EPCS. Now at HealthEast, we don't have 1,000 employed physicians and providers, but we have a lot of medical staff from independent groups in town that come to our hospital, and we wanted them to be able to do it as, as well. And then you can see the keyboard, uh, electronic keyboards with those embedded fingerprinting uh, technology on there. So when we talk about identity proofing, that really starts with our credentialing process. So when a new provider comes to us, they go through our credentialing process just like they do at your organizations. We confirm their DEA. We, we confirm that with an in-person visual identity. So we know that it's me, Dr. Smith, and this is my DEA number, so therefore I am able to prescribe within the system. An IS analyst then sets up that provider for EPCS in the EHR. They have to attend the training. So again, new providers, of course, are going to have to learn how to use our EHR. And as a part of that training, they have to pass a competency test for that. And then at the same time, they provide their biometrics, which we have used the fingerprint. There are other ways to do it. We thought the fingerprint was the easiest way to do it, and it's worked remarkably well. Um, so. As you can see, enrolling in the EPCS becomes part of that credentialing and provider training processes for all the new providers that come along. So we had to do everyone that we already had, and then the next week when we started getting new providers, we had to make this a part of the initial training for everybody that comes along. So right alongside things like, what do you do when there's a fire in the hall, and how to check your voicemail, we, we do that training right alongside it, and then, and then put your fingerprint on here. So. Each, finger, each physician provider picks two fingers to enroll. I guess if something happens to one of your fingers, you have a backup. Um, and they get a st simple step-by-step -step enrollment instruction guide, and then really they're ready to go. So as far as training and time goes, this is we're talking under two minutes to register, to enroll, to get your fingerprint working, and to be able to go. It's really one of the easiest things that we have. As mentioned, we did this as part of our EHR rollout. And it was new technology, change management, we had all that going. But what we started hearing almost immediately from the providers is that this new EPCS thing was the best part of our EHR go live. And technically it really wasn't <laughs> part of the EHR, but we were able to leverage that at the same time and it really helped us with the messaging around building our new EHR. The other part of it is it, when we did had an upgrade for our EHR in the, in the last almost a year ago, this EPCS function down, went down for a brief period of time, and that was really unpopular. <laughs> so when it's there, they love it. When it's not there, they certainly know it, and that's probably the indication of a good feature that you have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the workflow of how this works. Um, basically, I'm a provider. I'm, since I'm a clinic physician once in a while, I, that's where I'm coming from, where I'm going to describe. So I'm going in to see a patient. I come into the exam room. Mrs. Jones is there. I log in with my tap and go. I don't have to put in a password or anything like that. I just tap and go. I see the patient. I need to prescribe them a controlled substance. I go through the usual EHR workflow of entering a medication. Uh, once the EHR recognizes that this is an a controlled substance, I get prompted 
right off the bat in front of me with a square saying, put your finger on the fingerprint reader. I do. I put in my password, and it goes. It, le it adds maybe 12 seconds to writing a prescription when it's controlled versus non-controlled. Uh, amazing technology. It works really well. And like I said, the patients love to see it happen. They think it's really cool. So that prescription is sent then electronically to whatever pharmacy they want. And we use SureScripts as our intermediary there. The pharmacy fills, fills the prescription and they pick it up. The other nice part about this EPCS is we do use fingerprint technology in the rooms or at the hospital. But say I'm home on the weekend, I'm on call, uh, I, I have a way of prescribing this from home electronically as well using a soft token on my smartphone. So I, then the workflow changes just only minimally that instead of being prompted for my fingerprint, I'm prompted for a number series that I get on my iPhone or on my, on my smartphone. Uh, and I put that in and the same thing happens. So patients love this because they can get an appropriate refill on the weekend. Let's say it's my patient. I've known them for 20 years. I know that they're on MS Cotton because they have some bad diagnosis and they've been on it for a long time and I know because they're my patient, they're using it appropriately. They just ran out on Saturday afternoon. I can, don't have to, but I can go into the system and I can refill it for them. And that can't happen in the old world where I need to print it out and write it and sign it and give it to the patient. So we've added a huge amount of patient satisfaction with that functionality. We've added provider satisfaction because it's much easier than for an on-call person who doesn't know someone to say, well, I'm sorry, but I can't do that for you. But if it is me and I know who it is, I can do that for you. We also are currently implementing a, an electronic prior authorization process for all prescriptions, which again will complement and speed up this process. If I prescribe MS Cotton electronically, it lets me know that I might need a prior authorization for that, and then that goes over into our process. And we've we've sped up that PA process amazingly, and that's this has been a part of that. The um, go over the results. It's been pretty exciting. We like I said, we have been on this now since, in the hospital since June of 2014, and in the clinic since December of 2014. We have right now about 72% of our controlled substance prescriptions completed electronically at HealthEast. A little bit, I want to separate that out a little bit. If you look at our primary care clinics, it's over 90%, probably approaching 95%. And they, the, the primary care providers have really latched onto this and love it and couldn't imagine doing it any other way. Uh, and their volume obviously is quite high. What's limiting us at the hospital sometimes are, honestly, old and grain workflows, uh, finding that surgeons tend to like to write these prescriptions out the night before, the day before discharge, and leave them somewhere so that they can be taken home the next day when the patient leaves. This kind of harkens back to the good old days where we had paper clunky charts on a shelf and you know, doctors would do prescriptions and leave them on a paper clip on that chart. Well, there's no chart there anymore. So we're trying to work with those surgeons to come up with a better workflow to try to incorporate this and trying to help them realize the value of doing it this way. The real gain here has been in addition to patient satisfaction is reduction in overall time spent for control, pre prescribing controlled substances by about 500 hours per month, and that's really just looking at the clinics. Uh, you think about that and as, it, as how many FTEs that represents and what those folks can be doing other than doing busy work around controlled substance prescribing. It's amazing. We get questions a lot on, well, what, what happened to your service desk? Did you explode with questions or tickets? Uh, we really have had minimal tickets around EPCS. Um, very, very small number. Another big thing to think about is nursing involvement, down from 40 refills a day to really zero in most clinics, because you think about the old workflow where a patient calls in, they leave a message, the nurse gets that message, they have to call the patient back, talk to them about where they're at with their prescription, why do they need it refilled, this and that, then send me a message. Now the nurses don't even touch those refills. They come directly to me, I take care of them, they're done. And again, below there saying, 
the best part of our EHR Go Live was the APCS that you guys did. Um, we had a video that we wanted to show you. Uh, we're going to send out a link to that video. Um, the video kind of went through or showed you exactly what I just went through with the workflow process there. Unfortunately, it had a couple of really good looking people in it, uh, like Joanne and myself. Um, so uh, unfortunately, you couldn't see that today, but you can certainly take a look at it on uh, when you're able to do that. And it's rather informative and uh, is quite helpful to see. So I'm going to close up and make sure we have enough time for questions with our lessons learned. Simplify that EPCS process with a single multi-purpose solution. Do that rather than trying to do this with disparate technologies and manual processes. We had a solution that was brought, you know, that we worked with uh, folks to set up and do that really made this a nice single flowing solution that is just actually very elegant and very nice. Integration with the EHR, essential, really have to do that. If you can roll it out to you, roll it, you know, put it together with a rollout of your EHR if possible or with a version change or with an upgrade, that was something that we found very, very valuable. It's really quite easy to quantify those savings, which, you know, you've got to have your ROI on this investment. Provider efficiencies as well as patient safety and satisfaction, very, very high with this. It's really not rocket science, and it really is not going to break the bank for you. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Anthony, and we'll have time for questions after uh, one more little presentation here. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for that great presentation. Now we're going to hear from our sponsor, represented by Dan Borgasano with Improvata. Dan? Thanks, Anthony, and thanks, Dr. Smith, for that great presentation. Hello, everyone. Before we open it up for questions, I just want to quickly uh, provide information about Improvata Confirm ID, which is our end-to-end -end solution to enable EPCS. So Improvata Confirm ID is really designed to, again, be a comprehensive platform for helping you meet all of the DEA and, in some cases, specific state-level regulatory requirements for EPCS. That includes the identity proofing, access control workflows, of course, the two-factor authentication, and then all of the reporting that you need to do uh, in a way that also gives your physicians a fast and efficient e-prescribing workflow. Um, we'll talk about how we do that uh, in, in just a moment. So this kind of gives you a picture of all of the things that are included in the product itself. Um, and the idea is to give you, again, an end-to-end end way of doing this where there are no gaps. Dr. Smith talked about um, the inefficiencies if you try to do this using manual and processes and disparate technologies. Well, with Improvata, you're going to get a complete solution allowing you to do everything. So that starts, starts with the identity proofing, which Dr. Smith talked about. The DEA allows two types individual or institutional. Institutional is when you do this through your credentialing office because the hospital itself is a DEA registrant. Individual is where each individual physician will go to a uh, credential service provider approved by DEA and they'll go through the process themselves. Usually we recommend that process for organizations that do not have um, an institutional DEA number, but in either case, Confirm ID will support both and, and both are integrated into the product. There's also a nice uh, enrollment utility that allows you at the same time you're conducting the identity proofing to actually help the physician enroll whatever two-factor authentication credentials they'll be using for, for EPCS. So in Dr. Smith's case, he talked about using fingerprint uh, within the, the hospital and the clinics and then saw soft token uh, remotely. Well, with Confirm ID, you could actually help physicians enroll their fingerprints and enroll that soft token as accepted methods of authentication for EPCS. And that way, not only is it much easier for the physicians because they'll get the enrollment right, um, you know, versus potentially having to do it themselves, but also it binds the identity proofing to that credential. So again, you have no gaps from a security and compliance perspective. Um, Confirm ID is also <clears throat> integrated directly into the e prescribed workflows of all 
major EMRs, uh, whether it's Epic, Cerner, or otherwise. Um, so it's built right into that workflow. It makes it very easy for physicians. And then we also offer a wide variety of different uh, authentication options. So in the HealthEast case, again, they use password plus fingerprint um, uh, on-premise, and then password plus soft token uh, for remote e-prescribing. One of the misconceptions out there is that if a provider is already logged into their EMR, they've completed one factor of authentication, and then at the time of prescribing, they'll only need to enter one factor, a second factor. Uh, the fact is, the DEA uh, regulations are pretty clear that at the time of prescribing, the physician needs to enter two forms of authentication. So we try to provide flexibility that gives you the option of using the combination that will best suit your physician's needs in whatever scenario in which they'll be prescribing, uh, whether it's by department, uh, whether they're in the hospital or outside. We'll talk about a couple of those uh, mo modalities here shortly. So one of the things that Improvada offers exclusively, and these are some newer innovations uh, since HealthEast has, has, has rolled out their system. Um, you know, Dr. Smith talked about, you know, 10 to 12 seconds for the actual prescribing, you know, uh, added to the old way of doing things. Well, we've got new innovations here that cut that down dramatically. Um, they don't even involve any uh, typing of anything. So the first one is called hands-free authentication. And the way that this works is after the provider will place the EPCS order, they'll enter their first factor of authentication. In my example here, I have fingerprint, a biometric, but that could be a password as the first factor. Then hands-free authentication will automatically retrieve a soft token code that's running on that provider's mobile phone and wirelessly detect it and verify it and authenticate them. So even if that phone is locked and in their pocket, they don't have to touch it at all and they can complete that second factor of authentication. So you can imagine now if that's combined with fingerprint, you can essentially complete this two-factor of authentication simply by putting your fingerprint down, and it happens in milliseconds. So very fast, very efficient, uh, especially for you know, high-volume areas where a lot of controlled substances might be prescribed. Now, we also have a push notification. And this also uses a soft token uh, application that's running on the provider's phone, but this time there is uh, manual interaction. However, instead of having to unlock the phone, open up the token application, and manually typing over that six-digit code, Confirm ID will send a notification to the provider's mobile phone, and you can see here right from the lock screen, they simply swipe and press approve, and they're authenticated. So not quite hands-free, but you can see much faster than having to, to manually type over the token code. Um, and this is really great for remote prescribing uh, situations as well. And, you know, this particular uh, push notification is extensible to other workflows, um, including um, two-factor authentication for remote network access. So now if a physician is remote and needs to prescribe controlled substances electronically, they can two-factor into the network through the VPN using this push notification, and then they can, they can enter the required two-factor authentication for EPCS using the same fast and consistent workflow. So Improvada Confirm ID uh, is, is part of a broader comprehensive authentication platform um, that does more than just EPCS and the remote network access that we talked about. And some of the advantages, it gives you the ability to centralize the authentication on a single enterprise-wide platform. And these authentication policies include not only EPCS and remote access like we've talked about, but also single sign-on, virtual desktop access, and other workflows. And really by doing that, by standardizing on a single solution, it will help you reduce TCO and really streamline reporting across all of these different workflows. And importantly, it's going to eliminate the need for your users to carry or IT to manage different authentication modalities from different vendors. It all gives you one centralized solution that's very consistent and very easy to use. And as I, as I mentioned, you know, across all these different workflows, because we offer uh, different authentication modalities and an integration directly into your applications, we can enable the security in a way that's effectively invisible to your end users, um, which really minimizes disruption and will drive adoption. And then from a compliance perspective, you have improved visibility into all interactions with patient records across all of these different workflows. So that's just a little bit about Improvada Confirm ID. Anthony, I'll now hand it back to you for questions. 
Thank you very much, Dan. Appreciate uh, the presentation and sponsorship. All right, uh, now we have time for some Q&A, so go ahead and send those questions in. The Q&A box leaves the default set to all panelists. Uh, Todd, uh, Dr. Smith is going to be joined by Joanne Sunquist, SVP and CIO at Health East Care System. So Joanne, thanks so much for joining us. First off, let me start with you. Um, anything specific for your CIO friends out there? We heard the CMIO. Uh, perspective, any CIO specific thoughts on this project? Well, I thought it was really a great example of how we can partner with our users to accomplish something pretty significant. As, as Dr. Smith said, this is not an IS project. This is really a, a shared project with our providers, and it actually paved the way for a number of other projects that we're now working on or our ongoing optimizations. So it, it was a, a great example of how to work together. And then the other thing I'd like to reiterate, which Dr. Smith also said is, you know, this is not rocket science and it's not all that expensive. It did take us six months to implement it, but that was because we were doing it simultaneously with our EHR. I know a number of other organizations that have actually successfully implemented this in a much shorter time frame. So I just want to reinforce that message. Very good. Any thoughts on working on CIOs and CMIOs working together on this particular project? Um, you know, le who's leading, who's following, are we working together, um, and some sort of best practices in those two roles collaborating on this project? Yeah, it's, you know, again, it's an ex another example of partnership, and I saw my role as a lot of really getting this out to the providers, who most of whom I've known a long time, and, and uh, showing them, educating them, helping them with why this is necessary, or not really even necessary, but why this is a really great thing to do. It helps patients, so that, that's my role. Uh, and, you know, and then working with Joanne to help with the IS end of things and um, the teams here to get the technology right so that I know when I go out and talk to the docs that, that I know that this is going to be done correctly. And that's where mm -hmm. the, the great partnership does occur between you know, Joanne and myself. And actually, at the time that we rolled this out in our primary care clinics, uh, Dr. Smith was a provider in our primary yeah. care clinics. He was our physician champion. He was not our CMIO. Right. So he was actually our customer, so to speak, but played an integral role in helping to uh, bridge um, the communications between the, the physicians and IS. And he did such a good job, we made him the CMIO. So. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Uh, and yeah, but it was. It, you know, a head cheerleader would be one of those jobs, and and I took on that role with uh, with with very good energy, and uh, it, it worked out very well. So it, it is all about partnership and and getting the right people together and just explaining why what this can do and if. As I said, if providers hear that it will help their patients, that's how you get them to really understand what's going on. Very good. Joanne, I would imagine when you're doing anything that's going to um, touch on the DEA, uh, you want to be very careful that you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's. Um, any, any thoughts for your colleagues here on, on some things you definitely want to keep in mind when you're going down this road? Uh, so, uh, so you don't, I don't know, get audited or get visited by folks in suits that you don't really want to see. Uh, that's a very good question, and frankly, one of the reasons that we chose to work with Improvada because they have so much expertise in this. They have dotted those I's and crossed those T's over and over. And so we were confident that they knew what they were doing and they knew what the rules are. That being said, we are still responsible for our ongoing uh, collection of the data and the auditing to make sure that we are indeed um, um, doing this correctly. And that, that onus is, is on us and has required us to really have some more uh, advanced capabilities on the reporting side. But as far as the actual workflow and the automation, we relied uh, significantly on our vendor. Speaking of which, Dan, any thoughts there? Yeah, oh, thanks. Um, you know, the, the DEA regulations uh, are quite complex. Um, if any of you out there have actually looked at the document, I believe it's 85 pages short. Um, so a lot of different requirements there. Um, 
especially around the identity proofing and access controls, uh, the two-factor authentication requirement, and then what you have to do from a reporting perspective. And we get a lot of questions of just clarifying different elements of the DEA IFR. So <clears throat> we do have a lot of um, content available uh, that, that spells out um, exactly what you need to do and what your options are for, to meet a number of these different requirements. So you know, I definitely encourage you if, you, if you do have specific questions about certain parts of the regulations, um, the Improvata website has a lot of different papers and things that, that are designed to, to educate and clarify uh, on what exactly those uh, requirements are, as well as to dispel uh, some misconceptions that are out there. Um, you know, I talked about the uh, the two-factor authentication requirement, for example, um, but there are a number of other uh, questions that we get um, asking for clarification. Uh, so again, we do have some documentation there that that uh, breaks down those misconceptions and, and, and provides hopefully clear guidance as to what you need to do to be compliant. Very good. Um, Dr. Smith, any thoughts around uh, getting physicians uh, going on the new system, um, and especially the ornery ones? Not that, not that there are many, right? <laughs> well, there are a few, as I alluded to in the hospital. Uh, you know, part of it is really just demonstrating, as I mentioned, if you make it about the patients, that's how I found the best way to try to get providers to accept what, what you're doing or what you're trying to do. Show them the benefit to your patients, to their patients. Uh, demonstrate, you know, go into detail. Say, look, here's a patient situation. Don't you want them to be able to do this in an easier way? They might say no. They might say, you know, look, I kind of like the way that I do it. It's the way I've always done it. It's always been very secure. You're not going to win them all, but as, as mentioned, I've been able to talk to a couple of these surgeons, and I can at least get in front of them, show them. You just sit, I find sometimes you just have to sit down with them. Sit down. Let me show you how this works, and they say, "Oh, that's all it is," and 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 that's how you get them on your side. It's taking the time. It's it's demonstrating its effectiveness, how easy it is, and how it can make their lives better, as well as making their patient lives better. Then the other part of it is, you know, really for the new ones, it's part of their training. So they come in already drinking the Kool-Aid, if you will, that, that that this is the way we do it and this is why it advantages us. At new, when I go to new, patient, new provider orientation and talk to the new providers, to say, look, we're the only ones in the Twin Cities at the time that are doing this. We're one of very few nationally that are doing this. We're way ahead of the curve and this is why it's a really good thing then they can act as your ambassadors for some of the others that may be a little bit more resistant. Very good. All right. That's about all we had time for today. When you close out your WebEx window today, you'll be taken to a survey. If you could take a moment to answer that, we'd appreciate it. I want to thank our speakers, uh, Dr. Todd Smith, Joanne Sunquist, and Dan Borgasano. And I want to thank Improvada especially for sponsoring today's event. You'll receive an email when our archive recording has been posted to our YouTube channel. For those of you with continuing education um, interest in today's event, uh, attending our events gets you a CHIME CHCIO credit, so let CHIME know you were here, and if you've asked us to do so, we will. If you need a general certificate of attendance for another CEU program, you can use the final slide in this deck. If you'd like us to produce a webinar for you on the topic of your choice, you can contact Nancy Wilcox, and you can go to our website to see our upcoming schedule. So once again, I want to thank Dr. Smith, Joanne, Dan, Impravada, all our attendees. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.